If you have your outline, you'll note that it's titled, and by the way, let me mention this. Uh, we have some bike that have been out for a long while. Good to have you bike. But it's my understanding that Martha Higgins passed away. Don't know exactly when her services are, but uh, keep her and this family in your prayers and let's do what we can for them. I know when I was up at the hospital the other day, she was not doing well at all. Anyway, you find the title, Behind Every and All Sin. I hope by the time I finish that I will have clarified what that title means. We want to know that sin never, ever stands alone. Never. There is always something or someone behind every sin or all sins that are committed. But there is also a difference in the reasoning. And so, it's important we understand what sin is. As was read a moment ago, I beseech you, brethren, this is what Paul, Peter, that we're to be sober and be vigilant because our adversary, the devil... He's pacing or walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Behind every sin stands Satan. Every single one of them. And that's why Peter describes him precisely as a roaring lion. Just ready to destroy us, to eat us alive. And so when we see this, we understand that Satan hates Jesus. He hates God. He hates the Holy Spirit. Actually, he hates me and you and every human being that there will ever be on this earth. Amen. Literally hates. And so he wants us to sin because he realizes that this is what separates us from God. That is it, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It's those sins or those iniquities that we commit that pulls us away from God. But Isaiah reminds us that God's hands are reaching out. His eyes are open, his ears are open. He doesn't want us to be lost and destroyed. He knows And this is Satan. He knows that sin is sin, no matter what the sin is. And all and every sin separates us from God. Now I will say this. Some sins are more horrific than others. And the fact that some carry with it a higher consequence or consequences. Amen. We need to understand that. Right is right and wrong is wrong. You can never justify wrong. Never. And so there are greater consequences to some sins than others. We need to know that and I think we do. He wants nothing less, this is Satan, nothing less than to have victory over us. He wants to win. And by the way, as I think about this, we have to admit that Satan has a tremendous victory record. Sad to say, isn't it? But he can hold his banner high and say, look what I've done. And that's unfortunate. We have a choice to make, brethren. And it's between me and God and Satan. You have a choice to make because it's between you and God and Satan. Yes, we have decisions to make. Do we wish to be the victor over Satan? Or do we really care? We are not an inanimate object. We're not. We're not an inanimate object object with no ability to affect our outcome. 
In James chapter 4 and verse 7, James says, Submit yourselves, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and guess what the devil will do? He'll flee. I believe that because that's what the Bible teaches. Satan will flee from you. If I draw close to God and resist the devil, he has no choice but to flee from me. He knows he cannot deal with God. But again, we need to understand that we're not an inanimate object. We're not robots. We're not something or someone that have no choice, can make no choice, or cannot help what we do or do not do. Because we can. And so this is the second point. On your outline, behind every or all sin is guess what? One's heart. And I, I'm speaking from the aspect of the biblical heart and not the physical heart. This heart, the mind of man. Because there's where it all begins, brethren. Every sin begins in the heart or in the mind. And we need to understand that the mind or the heart of man is like soil. It's like soil that where seed can be planted. In Luke chapter 8, we look at verses 8 through 14. And Jesus teaches a tremendous, a tremendous lesson using a physical to relate to a spiritual. And other fell on good ground, he said, and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given, listen to him, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Them come, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. Mind. Lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among the thorns are they, which, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring forth no fruit to perfection. Don't you know that Satan knows exactly what he's doing? But don't you also know that God knows exactly what he's doing? We are not inanimate objects. We have the choice either to serve God or Satan. Because behind every sin is one's heart. Things can and do enter into the heart. Jesus asked a great question in Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 12. Then he clears it up a little bit more as he goes into chapter, or we go into chapter 15. He said, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bring forth good things. That's true. And an evil man out of an evil treasure brings forth evil things. Now let's back up to Mark's account. Because it enters into his heart, this is Mark 7, 19, but in, excuse me, enters not into his heart, but into the belly and goes out into the draught, purging all meats. What a tremendous thing Jesus had to ask here. And if you read the context of that, you're going to find out when we put something into our physical body, when we go into, into our tummies, not our heart, 
But when it goes into our tummy, eventually it comes out. And I'm just being simple. Amen. And what Jesus wants us to know is what goes into the heart, it's going to cause something to happen. And that's why he says in Matthew 12, 35, a good man, listen to him, out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth what? Good things. Tremendous difference between the heart and the belly. It's an amazing thing that we read what we read. Because later on in Matthew 15, 18, and 19, here's what Jesus says. But those things which proceed out of the mouth cometh from, excuse me, out of the mouth come forth from the heart. And they that defile the man, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Isn't that something? Murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemy. And then we come back up to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so behind every and all sin is one's heart. Many, many times we make excuses as to why we do or do not do something. And brethren, I have to stand before you with all sincerity. We need to stop making those excuses. There is no excuse. But we do make them. We need to understand that, again, as we've just noted, from these particular scriptures, what is in our heart becomes our thoughts for good or for evil. It depends on what we put in there. And that will be our treasure. I try to tell people this. The mind sometimes should remind us of a computer. Because what you put on a computer, it's there. You may delete it. You may remove it, but it's still there. It's recorded. It's out there somewhere. And so if you put something bad on there, then it can be found. Put something good on there, it can be found. And I think that we'd all be surprised if we knew how much how much of our privacy is being invaded upon our computers. It probably would cause us to put them down and not touch them again. There is no such thing as privacy because out in cyberspace, they can do just about anything they want to. Our minds are the same way. If we think wrong, guess what we're going to do? we're going to act wrong. If we think right, then we're going to do right. If we do anything out of doubt, we fail to do anything almost all the time. The mind is powerful, very powerful. I often tell people that I talk with, it's sort of like this, it's sort of simple, trash in, trash out. Just that simple. Good in, good out. Why? Because we're not an inanimate object with no ability to the effect of our outcome. So yes, the heart can be kept pure, but it requires a diligence on our part. It doesn't just happen. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, Solomon says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That is so true. That is so true. In Proverbs 20 and verse 9, Solomon says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. Who can say that? Those who keep their heart 
with all diligence. They can say that. And so these things are very important. God is holding each of us, me, you, and everyone, highly responsible for what comes into our heart and goes out. That's why we should be very good students of this right here. This thing called the Bible, and I say thing respectfully. God's Word. It can make us what we ought to be. But if we put this thing down, this thing called the Bible, we begin to drift and wander. We become doubters, uninterested. We become more involved in pleasures of the world and pleasures of, the, of, of, of sin than we do God and His Word. So yes, He does hold us responsible. So behind every and all sin is one's heart. But also behind every and all sin are consequences. Be careful. Very careful. For an example, I believe from what Scripture teaches me that I need to look at myself. As a matter of fact, Paul says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. I need to examine myself. And so I need to be careful that I do not deceive, that I do not deceive myself or be tricked by my own deception. And so therefore, everything begins with me. If I allow you to fool me, that's really my fault. I need to be sure that I know of what's happening and what's going on and so on and so forth. Look at Romans chapter 16 and verse 18. For they that are such, now listen to him, that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. What is Paul talking about? Go back to the context and you'll look at those that are serving sin. They love the pleasures of sin more than they do God. They're very selfish and self-centered and very worldly in their actions. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. God help us that we do not deceive people by our words. Some people want to trust us. Most people want to trust us. And when we tell people that we're Christians and we fail to be what we say we are, we have deceived them. Now, we haven't deceived God. And so we need to be very careful at looking at ourselves. Please don't deceive yourselves. Or don't let other people trick you, as Paul talked about here in Romans 16 and 18. When Paul wrote that second epistle to the church in Corinth, in chapter 2 and verse 4, he said, For out of much affliction and anguish, listen to him, out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I write unto you, unto you with many tears. My, my. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Have you ever sat down, just sat at your table or desk or computer and sent a letter or a note or a message to someone with tears? Letting them know that you love them even though you don't agree with what they're doing? It's something like that. In the church at Colossae, you know, he writes. But then we find this, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with what? Enticing words. You see, people can be fooled by and with enticing words. We might call it flattery. We could call it deception. We could call it trickery. Outright lies or hypocrisy. And so that's why we find in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, or 3, here's what he says, but I fear, lest by any means, 
As the serpent beguiled Eve through the, the trickery, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity. Listen to that. That is in Christ. Paul was concerned about these people and their hearts. He was concerned about the sin and sins that they were engaged in, that they had committed, and what they had done with that. And so what we have to understand is this, brethren, each of us, me, you, and everyone else, will reap what we sow. Hosea, that old prophet of old in Hosea 8, chapter 7, I mean, chapter 8, verse 7, made a tremendous statement because he said, for they have sown to the wind and they have reaped the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. Why? Because they have sown to the wind, and he said they shall reap the whirlwind. Well, what does Paul tell us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 today? Be not deceived. There's that word again. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. These are very, very important words. And so when we Think about these consequences of sin. It may be the works of the flesh. It may be religious error. It could be defrauding others, and we could just go on and on and on. Sin always carries, always carries certain consequences. Some higher consequences and more staggering and more devastating than others. But sin is sin. Do not ever think for one moment that you can sin and get by with it. Don't ever think that. You might get it past men and you may long forget that sin or sins since man didn't find out. But God still knows and he always knew. So we're not getting by with anything consequences of some sin or sins come in this life. Some never do come until we face eternity. That's why it's important that we remove sin from our lives. Every single one of them. Because those sins that are not repented of, they're going to face us on the day of judgment. And then we need to understand that behind every and all sin, we're hurting Jesus. The very one who died for our sins, we're hurting him. Can you imagine the grief that is taking place with our Lord to have to record our sins? Can you imagine that for a moment? And yet we do it as though it's nothing. You know, it's no one's business. I'm not hurting anyone. You may not be hurting anyone personally, but you're hurting our Savior. And I know it has to be very painful for him to record my sins. It hurts him. He is hurting. I know Jesus is hurting right now. Not a physical hurt. He'll never go through that again. But he's hurting and knowing that he has children that are sinning and they really have no, no uh, desire or have no plans of getting out of that sin or sins. And yes, he regretfully is having to record that. I can only imagine how it hurts him. And so when we sin, then we hurt our Savior and when we hurt Him, then we hurt God and we hurt the Holy Spirit because one cannot be hurt without the other. It sort of goes like this. When someone hurts someone in your family, doesn't it also hurt you? 
Yes, it does. But it doesn't only hurt you, but it hurts the rest of the family also. It's very painful. We need to understand that deity can be hurt and can be grieved. Paul said, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's very haunting to me. Because I know that if I grieve deity, then I bring grief upon the complete Godhead. Jesus grieved over the sins of Israel, didn't he? We find in Matthew 23 and verse 37, he cried out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets, now listen to him, and stones them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. That grieved Jesus, grieved him greatly. He wept over the sins of Israel. Do we really think that Jesus has changed any? Don't think that he has, because he hasn't. We need to understand that sin is serious. Oh, I know the world laughs at it. I know the world mocks at it. I know that we're called fools, but that's okay. We should not think so lightly of sin. And as I close this out, remember this. If you love God, think about this. Every sin that we commit hurts God. It hurts Him. The one thing that I'm very grateful for, for my family, my mom and my dad, they taught us to respect them as a mother and as a dad. And I was thinking last night as I was sitting there studying and going over this again, my mind went from this to, and I thank God that I can say this, I don't have to go to my grave knowing or even thinking that I ever showed disrespect to my parents. I disrespected my mother one time at about age eight. And I still haven't really gotten over it. I know God has long forgiven me for that. But sometimes it's hard to forgive yourself. When someone who takes care of you, who protects you, who loves you, who sacrifices for you all the days of their lives and you show them disrespect. But God is in a higher place than that. Because on the day of judgment, I'm not going to stand before my mother or my dad. But I am going to stand before God Almighty. And I'm going to be judged by His Son and my Savior, Jesus Christ. So I know that when we sin and show disrespect or dishonor our parents, it hurts them. Hurts them more than we'll ever know. But compound that to a point of God. We cannot really measure that. But I can only imagine in my little mind how that I hurt God when I sin. If I show disrespect to my parents, or I lie to someone, or I use someone, or I this, or I that. Yes, I have hurt that person, but I've hurt God also. It just compounds. I've hurt the Holy Spirit who has revealed unto us this precious word that tells me how to live and how to die. And my question as I end this, haven't we hurt them enough? Haven't we? We're living in a time when we don't even blush at sin anymore. We don't even blush at it. 
We're doing just exactly what they did in the old days, in the Old Testament. We're calling that which is good evil. And we're calling that which is evil good. We need to change if we're wrong. I think one of the worst things that man can do is procrastinate. Thinking that, oh, I'll wait till the next time. Or I'll wait later on. I'm going to do that. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is weeping for you. Satan's laughing at you. And let's be honest. He's the victor and not you. The only way we change that is to change ourselves. If you're not a Christian, I say this with love and concern. Satan owns you because he controls you. But you can shake him off. You can get away from him by obeying the gospel. That's why we're to hear. That's why we're to believe. That's why we're to repent. That's why we're to confess Christ. That's why we're to be baptized for the mission of our sins. John 5, 24, John 8, 24, Luke 13, 3, Matthew 10, 32, Acts 2, and verse 38, and multitude of other scriptures. Then we become the victor because now you belong to the Lord. Now very quickly, for those of us that are members of the church, who are we serving? Who is the victor? Am I the victor or is Satan? Something to consider, isn't it? It's something we must consider. I don't want to hurt God. I know I do from time to time or Christ or the Holy Spirit. But I also want to be willing to say I'm repenting. So this morning, think about this. Because behind every and all sin are consequences. Now and eternally, if they're not taken care of. If you need to respond, please do so.